Live from KSAT 12, Good Morning San Antonio starts right now. Good morning. Happy Tuesday. It is April 2nd. It's a pretty good week so far. We had storms overnight. We've heard the weather's going to be great today and again tomorrow. There's only one catch as we go outside with live cam. And that would be the fact that not only do we have the normal allergens, but yes. with the rain, that's going to increase the mold count in the next day or so. Yeah. Yeah, oak though. That that man, it uh, went through the roof this morning. Uh, not what we wanted to see. We were hoping some of that rain, as you guys were talking about, would wash out some of the oak. It did not. Uh, look at the number, 21,380. Basically four times the number that we saw yesterday. So we want to make sure everyone's aware that oak is going to cause a lot of problems today if it's uh, something you're allergic to. Not only that, uh, we had a wall of dust come out of West Texas yesterday evening along that front. So there's also some dust in the atmosphere too. Not a great day to be out and about if uh, allergens or something that get to you. Uh, let's look at some of the rainfall. So this is the positive side. We got some rain out of it. We got some hail too, but these are the rainfall totals. The airport picked up about 14 hundredths of an inch over at Randolph about 28 hundredths of an inch, mostly around a quarter of an inch at best, although Rio Medina did pick up uh, 0.71. So these numbers were pretty good. Good to see the rain. Of course, we did not necessarily want the severe weather, but um, some of that dust I was talking about mixing with the rain, you can see on the lens there <laughs> some of the uh, the uh, mud that more or less that collected on the screen. Uh, hail track. We're going to talk more about that. Where did the hail move through yesterday? We've got some pictures for you and then some chilly mornings ahead. We'll have some 40s in the forecast next few days. And lastly, of course, the eclipse update. What's the latest? It really all hinges on a cold front. And we're going to talk more about that here in just a few minutes. But let's get over to RJ now. We had some wet roads earlier. They've dried up now. Yeah, things uh, things getting better a little bit out there. But uh, I want to say, Justin, on that pollen count, man, anytime I see purple on there, that's not good. <laughs> that's never good. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I'm an oak sufferer. So that oak, uh, definitely uh, no joke out there. All right, speaking of out there, I-37 Pecan Valley, take a look here at the exit ramp because we have a crash that has actually blocked the exit ramp there for all of our drivers coming in northbound 37 at Pecan Valley. This is going to be for all of our drivers coming in from the southeast military area. As you take a look here at our maps and you see that uh, not only we have that crash there, but of course that exit is blocked is blocked there there at uh, northbound uh, 37 at uh, Pecan Valley. Speaking of this area, because it's been very busy, uh, we actually have just cleared out another stalled vehicle that was 35 northbound over there at Malone that was headed towards the Burbank High School area. But we still have a stall being reported there at I-10 East at uh, 37. So not only do we have this exit ramp blocked there at Pecan Valley, we also have a situation there I-10 East at uh, um, right there at 37. Stalled vehicle also being reported at I-10 eastbound at Medical Drive. This is going to be for all of our drivers coming in inbound from the northwest side headed to that I-10-410 area. As we take a look here at our city map and you do see a couple of these incidents here on 37 and then there's that incident right there at I-10. Good news is that we had a stalled vehicle earlier on the far northwest side up by Camp Bullis and I-10. That has been cleared out so that's good news for our drivers. One thing to keep in mind is that we are going to see some overnight construction taking place back on the north east side as they do the NEX expansion also 1604 and I-10 those crews had taken a little bit of a break for the Easter holiday but we'll continue to monitor this give you more e details as they become available to us Mark and Stephanie back to you guys RJ thank you the Bear County Sheriff's Office looking for a missing teenager have you seen him this is 13 year old and we don't know if it's Jason or Jacon Shark uh, Starks we have asked the Bear County Sheriff's Office for a pronunciation and we have not yet heard back but he was last seen on Friday at his home on Sunset Place. That's a neighborhood in West Bear County near South Ellison and Ravenfield Drive. He was last seen wearing a black hoodie and black jogger, joggers or sweatpants. If you know where he is, you're asked to call the Bear County Sheriff's Office at 210-335-6000. And for now, let's look at today's Nine at Nine. The first over-the-counter birth control pill is now available at some pharmacies. CVS says the O-Pill is now available on its website and will be in stores later this month. It's also coming to Walmart stores. Walgreens started selling it last month. It costs $20 per month with discounts available for buying multiple months doses at once. Another issue with the FAFSA, some colleges received the wrong information about some family finances. 
Administrators blame that on what they call inaccurate tax data from the IRS. Either way, the delays have left some students in limbo as they decide where to enroll. Students typically receive information from colleges in March about how much financial help they'll receive, but many are still waiting to get that information. Turns out Google's incognito mode wasn't all that anonymous. The search giant has agreed to delete billions of personal records, including from people using the incognito Chrome browser they thought was private. It's part of a settlement in a 2020 class action suit accusing Google of illegal surveillance. UPS is going to become the main air cargo provider for the U.S. Postal Service. The arrangement with the Atlanta shipping company takes effect in late September. That's when the current contract with FedEx expires. An overhaul at Frontier Airlines. The no-frills carrier is tapping into a growing demand for premium travel, cutting flights to Vegas and Orlando, and adding trips to Seattle, Indianapolis, and other cities with less competition from other low-fare airlines like Southwest, JetBlue, and Spirit. Frontier is also adding more seats with extra legroom. OpenAI is making it easier to use ChatGPT even if you don't have an account. Users can now access the company's older platform for free without locking in, and you can opt out of data training. OpenAI says the move is part of its effort to get more people to experience the benefits of AI. Apple is moving past some of its own devices. The iPhone 6 Plus is now on the obsolete list, meaning no more repairs or services at Apple stores. The iPad Mini 4 has been added to the vintage list along with the red iPhone 8. That means only two more years of service. A groundbreaking device will allow people with vision problems to experience next week's solar eclipse. Researchers at Harvard have developed light sound, which converts sunlight into music played through headphones. Bright light sounds like a flute. Dimmer light sounds like a clarinet. Powerball jackpot has now surpassed $1 billion. It now stands at an estimated $1.09 billion after there was no winner in last night's drawing. Six tickets did match the first five numbers, and those winners get $1 million each. The next drawing is tomorrow night, and that's today's Night at Night. The morning headlines, voters in Florida get to decide on abortion laws and an incredible rescue off of a cliff. And we have lost another American World War II hero. David Sears is here with your morning headlines. Few and few of those heroes are left. This is a, a true hero from World War II, the USS Arizona. We'll talk about that in a second, but first let's start with this. The Florida Supreme Court has taken up the issue of abortion. We'll let the people of Florida have the ultimate decision. However, a law passed by the state legislature and signed by Governor Ron DeSantis will go into effect. That law goes on the books May 1st. It puts a six week ban on abortion, but the Florida Supreme Court also ruled that voters will have a chance to override that law with a measure on the ballot this November. It would amend the state's constitution and establish a right to abortion. This happening in California, not a movie, it's real life. That's a hiker and he is hanging on the edge after he slipped down the side of a cliff. He is about 50 feet from the bottom. You can see this is from night vision from the helicopter that's going to rescue him. He seems just hanging there. They were able to get to him, get him in a harness and hoist him to safety. He has, he was holding on for about an hour as those big waves beat against the shore of the San Francisco Bay right below him. The rescuer afterwards speaking with him said that that was one of the most precarious rescues um, because of how, how the victim was grabbing on and how quickly they were to, to let him go. The climber suffered some cuts, scrapes on his hands and feet. Otherwise, he's going to be okay. A sad day for America, but on the other hand, a day to celebrate the life of Lou Conter. He was the last survivor of the USS Arizona that sank during that attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese back on December 7th, 1941. That hurled the U.S. into World War II. Conter passed away at the age of 102. He was a lieutenant commander and was one of 93 on the USS Arizona who survived the attack. More than 1,100 sailors and Marines were lost. Conter actually stayed on the ship even while it was sinking. He described the scene back in 2018 to some U.S. veterans. He orders the guys were running out of the fire and it was pretty bad. And then said, knock them unconscious if you have to because they'll, if they jump over the side, they're gonna burn to death in the fire. So we laid uh, 15 or 60 of them down on the deck there. Unbelievable stories from that, that, from that day. Conter went on to flight school and then flew 200 missions during that war. He also fought in the Korean War 
He retired from the Navy back in 1967. He spent the rest of his life making sure that we never forget what happened on that day in 1941. And he will truly be missed. And once again, we're losing a lot of our World War II veterans. I, there's only a few hundred left, I believe. Yeah, the greatest lives. generation yep. is nearly gone. Yep, nearly. But hey. those pictures will remain, and we yeah. got to remember. Yes, sir, we All do. Right. Thank, Thank you. you very much, David. Right now, 908, 61 degrees, still ahead on GMSA at 9. It is National Autism Awareness Month, and this morning we are highlighting a training program that is helping law enforcement officers better understand autism spectrum disorders. Plus, we're continuing to get you ready for the total solar eclipse next week. When we come back, meteorologist Mia Montgomery shows us some of the research opportunities that are being set up for this rare event. It is safe to say that a total eclipse is pretty rare, especially one that reaches totality over parts of our area. And that's why scientists are excited for the many research opportunities that will stem from the eclipse next week on both a local and national scale. Meteorologist Mary Montgomery gives us a sneak peek into what some of the research looks like even right here in San Antonio. <laughs> this is so cool, I feel like we're in our physics lab. From the lab to the outdoors and even to outer space, Researchers across the nation and right here in the Alamo City are using the total eclipse as a rare opportunity to conduct research. No matter what part of the astro field you're in, it's a big a conglomerate, a big gathering of the science community. Finus Stribling is a research assistant at UTSA who is currently studying the life cycle of a star in Stardust. His studies use light from the sun on a day-to-day -day basis to figure out what's happening within those stars. And it's just one example of the many research opportunities the Stardust Group at UTSA is conducting during the eclipse. They're doing a lot of uh, things with insects and how insects interact. And we're doing a lot of things for the, uh, the visually impaired community and how we're using like, textiles so they can feel what's going on even though they can't see and things like that. Across town at the San Antonio Zoo, zookeepers and researchers like Dr. Charles Ritzler will be keeping a close eye on how certain animal species respond to the eclipse. Because so little is known about how animals react to eclipses housed here in zoos. Ritzler says there was one previous study done during the 2017 solar eclipse when the path of totality crossed over the Riverbank Zoo in Columbia, South Carolina. Their findings? That animals started to prepare for their end of day activities. Gorillas were seen walking closer to their sort of indoor keeper areas. Elephants were seen getting less active. So that was our, our hypothesis here at the zoo. This is the home of the flamingos. Around 1.30 p.m. on April 8th, zookeepers and researchers like Charles are going to be monitoring their behavior to see if they respond to the dimming sky. And while that's just a taste of the research being conducted locally, the opportunities continue in an even bigger way on a national scale. Enter NASA. So back in 2017, the sun was in a solar minimum, so it was not as active but right now we're in a solar maximum. That solar maximum is one of the reasons why this year's total eclipse is different from the one seven years ago. NASA chose a handful of experiments to conduct during this year's eclipse, from getting clearer pictures of the sun's corona to figuring out if radio or GPS signals could be affected. Their findings may be used in future NASA missions and space exploration. And with the next total eclipse not taking place until 2044 in the United States, it's a rare opportunity that connects researchers from all over the nation to those right here in San Antonio. Mia Montgomery, KSAT 12 News. Thanks, Mia. And KSAT is your eclipse authority. And tomorrow, a reminder, at 7 p.m., our weather team will be holding an eclipse special online to get you ready for Monday. So they're going to explain things in more depth and answer any questions you may have. So if you scan that QR code there on the corner of your screen, it will take you to the web article where you can submit your questions. So again, join us tomorrow at 7 p.m. for that live stream on KSET.com, KSET Plus, and the KSET YouTube channel. If you're still looking for eclipse glasses for the big day, we can hook you up. Today, meteorologist Adam Kasky will be out at Tacos Norteño on Hebner Road near Eckert for our Weather Authority Eclipse Glasses Giveaway. You start lining up at 5 p.m. Glasses go out about 6.30. There are only 300, though, so make sure you get in line early. And if you can't make it out there today, don't worry. We'll be holding another giveaway tomorrow. You ready to answer all those questions tomorrow evening? I am. I, and listen, the harder the better. We like to be stumped, so bring on, bring on the questions. <laughs> okay. I'm thinking right. of some good ones, so uh, yeah. It'll be fun, and yes, we do have some glasses giveaways coming up too, so don't fret if you don't have your glasses yet, but 
Start making plans. Uh, hopefully you've made plans by now. Uh, and hopefully the weather cooperates. Yeah. We got to first talk about, though, what happened last night. It was loud. Uh, had some hail, at least in parts of the city. This was one of the hail swaths with one of our stronger storms. It was a severe storm that came through San Antonio between 10 and 11 o'clock. And this was the path it took. Uh, it was right around 410 and Culebra, Culebra where we saw uh, the largest hail. And we have some picture proof of that. But you can see it uh, came across uh, near the airport, across Windcrest, and then uh, just south of Schertz uh, before winding down, before it got into Seguin. Uh, and yes, this was some of the larger hail. Uh, this was at West Commerce and 39th Street, but larger than a quarter, not quite egg size, but that's a great representation to give us uh, uh, an idea of what the size of that hail uh, was. And again, there were some larger pieces mixed in there, hopefully not a lot of damage, uh, but it was, uh, it was busy last night with those storms coming through. And we mentioned some of that dust mixing with the rain too, leaving Cars a little bit dirty this morning. Uh, the skies have cleared, and it's uh, it's really nice now. Temperatures are at 55 at the airport, 57 in New Braunfels, 59 Bernie, 45 in Kerrville. Still a little chilly there, but it will warm up. Uh, dew points have fallen off in a big way, too. So we've got dew points in the 30s, and this drier air will continue to flow in here on a northwesterly wind. And the humidity really does not come back until Saturday. So we're going to enjoy a pretty nice stretch here of of dry weather. All that humidity is getting pushed off to the east where we're still seeing some storms across far east Texas this morning, parts of Louisiana and Arkansas. Uh, now the severe weather risk today is still there, but it's much farther to the east. Uh, yesterday we saw some tornadoes around Oklahoma. Today there is a pretty significant threat of some tornadoes from Cincinnati up to Columbus, parts of Ohio and Kentucky. This is a place that will really uh, probably endure quite a bit of severe weather into the afternoon hours, uh, but well east of us. So our forecast today, 74 noontime, 76 at 1 o'clock, 78 2 o'clock. We're up around 80 this afternoon. A really nice day, but the winds will kick up out of the northwest anywhere from 10 to 20, but we could get some gusts higher than that, maybe 25 to 30 miles per hour. That also presents a bit of a, a fire threat as you go out west of San Antonio. So we want to mention that too. What does the forecast look like down the line? So this first low starts to move away. That's the one that creates the severe weather today. Then we get a period of pretty quiet weather. Another low starts to build late this week, late this work week, and then into the weekend starts to move towards the middle part of the country. This helps to bring a few showers and storms to our forecast Saturday night into Sunday morning also helps to bring a front through. And this front is going to be so important when it comes to what our weather looks like for the eclipse. So this is Monday. That front will be somewhere around San Antonio. Where it ends up is going to have a huge bearing on rain chances and also cloud cover. Right now, looks like we'll have some clouds around, but maybe, maybe we can fit this eclipse in. We'll see. Uh, the, the computer models are kind of jumping around a little bit, but right now we've got a 20% chance of rain on Monday with mostly cloudy skies. But backing up a little bit, 80 on Wednesday, 83 Thursday, 83 Friday, we've got morning lows in the 40s, so some chilly mornings, nice afternoons. There's that rain chance Saturday into Sunday. Right now we have it at about a 30% chance, and I think over the next two or three days we'll really get some clarification on what we can expect on Eclipse Day. All right. Well, we'll look forward to that then. Yes. Thank you, Justin. Mm -hmm. Join us tomorrow morning for a phone bank benefiting the Texas Organ Sharing Alliance. April is National Donate Life Month, and it's a time to celebrate the generous gift donors have given to their recipients a second chance at life. It is also a time to bring awareness to the importance of registering to become an organ and tissue and eye donor. Making that decision is an important and very personal one. So tomorrow morning, we'll have representatives from the Texas Organ Sharing Alliance on hand to answer questions you may have and help you sign up to become a donor. If you already know you want to become one, you can scan the QR code on your screen and it will take you to the online fill-out form. Time now, 920 and 62 degrees for now. Everyone is waiting to see when interest rates will come down, but until then, there's some things we can do now to make it a little easier on our wallets. We'll explain when we come back. For anyone with big loans, those of us paying off credit cards or financing a new car, there's still one looming question. When will these interest rates come down? 
Well, new numbers watched closely by the Federal Reserve show we may be waiting a few more months. CNN's Mike Valerio explains what experts say we should know as we wait for borrowing costs to get a little easier for our wallets. The magic number the Federal Reserve wants for inflation is 2%, so prices stay stable and household budgets don't take a beating. Fed Chair Jerome Powell says that level is about where he'd be more comfortable cutting interest rates. New numbers out Friday from the Commerce Department show a key measure of inflation for the 12 months ending in February came in at 2.5 percent. In January, it was 2.4 percent. These inflation numbers, it means the Federal Reserve is not going to be in a hurry to cut interest rates. Greg McBride, chief financial analyst at Bankrate, says a rate cut is still months away, possibly in June. And when one eventually happens, do not expect borrowing costs to tumble. If you have your money in a high yield savings account, you're still earning four and a half, five percent or even more. And when those interest rates come down, Yes, they'll come down a bit, but you're still going to be earning well ahead of inflation. McBride's advice, pay down debt as aggressively as possible. Take advantage of 0% and other low rate balance transfer options. And a continued bright spot, even as rates slowly come down, our savings accounts. Interest rates took the elevator going up. They increased very dramatically uh, over the last two years. But they're going to take the stairs coming down. Interest rates are going to come down slowly, even once the Fed starts to cut rates. And so lower rates are not going to bail you out if you've got large credit card debt or you've got other uh, high cost debts. In Los Angeles, I'm Mike Valerio. 925, 62 degrees, a lot more ahead on GMSA at 9. Including how San Antonio police cadets are being trained to better understand autism spectrum disorders so they can be better equipped to handle different situations they encounter. Plus, you may not think the eclipse would have any impact on blood supplies and donations, but it does. When we come back, how the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center is preparing themselves for incidents that may come up next Monday when a whole lot of visitors will be in our area. Welcome back. Just about 930, local nonprofits have teamed up to create a training program to help San Antonio police cadets better understand autism spectrum disorders. Well, for National Autism Awareness Month, Tiffany Huertas is diving deep into how organizations are working together to spread awareness and education. We describe my son as the nicest person you've ever met in your life. Robert Peden says his son Logan was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder when he was two years old. My son was diagnosed at two years old at Triple Army Medical Center in Hawaii when I was in the United States Air Force. Peden's love for his son and passion for helping parents navigating autism spectrum disorder eventually led him here. This is why we do this training. He is part of this program that started last year. It teaches San Antonio police cadets how to respond to incidents involving people with autism. Peden works at Any Baby Can of San Antonio, a nonprofit that serves families with children and youth facing serious health or developmental challenges. The organization also provides autism support. Margarita Yamas is a parent educator in that department and believes this training can save lives. We do give them some uh, exercises or some, you know, some situations that they actually learn how to feel what the children that have autism or the individuals that have autism, how they feel. How Any Baby Can of San Antonio says in Bear and the surrounding counties, over 30,000 people are living with autism. Be prepared to be Another organization involved in this course is Family out. Adventures. Okay. Nicole Santiago okay. is the CEO. One of my clients was unlawfully arrested and I filed a complaint and we had a meeting and the police were open to us coming in to train. Every cadet class is now taking these trainings. We talk about different sensory needs, different communication needs. So for example, I have communication boards I use. So sometimes if someone becomes with their anxiety, they become non-speaking, they can use the board to point to what they want to say. The CDC says about one in 36 children has been identified with autism spectrum disorder. Disorder. Autism is a developmental disability or disorder that is diagnosed in childhood and it affects communication um, chiefly. It also affects social skills, um, sensory processing. The training is super helpful because it helps develop a level of competency in our new officers. These are cadets preparing to become officers serving the community and it helps them to develop relationships and to learn how to interact with really all people from our community. Tiffany Huertas, KSET 12 News. 
We'd like to continue this conversation. Join us two weeks from today on the 16th at 2 p.m. for our KSAC Community Town Hall. We will hear inspiring stories of neighbors in our community explore how organizations are coming together to support and assist families with autism spectrum disorders. Tiffany will be hosting that town hall. You can join the conversation by tuning in the live stream on KSAT.com, KSAT Plus, or any way you stream us. Let's look out there with live cam. Yeah, the nice weather is here already, but what a price to pay. We're all sniffling and sneezing oh, over yeah. here. Telling you. <laughs> Uh, I have yet to find a person who's not dealing with uh, allergies this morning between the oak pollen and the dust and everything else. It's, uh, it's not fun, but we are getting some blue skies out there. It's going to be a, a nice afternoon. We are six days away now. You're going to start hearing a lot about the forecast for the eclipse. We're not going to be able to get into specifics yet, uh, despite what you may see on social media or whatnot. Uh, we do think clouds are likely, okay, but it's a, it's a question of the amount of cloud cover and there is a chance of showers and storms, although the models have backed off of that just a little bit. So there's still a lot of uncertainty here, a lot of moving parts. And when it comes down to just needing an hour for that eclipse to happen for us to see the totality, it's much too early to talk about an hour by hour forecast. But we will get there and we'll certainly keep you posted. We are pouring through the models uh, to make sure we get an accurate forecast for you. 80 degrees. Our forecast for today, 81 Casterville, 81 in Hondo, 70s up in the hill country. It'll be a nice day, just a little breezy. We'll get those gusts upwards of 25 miles per hour uh, midday through the early afternoon before those winds calm a bit. But with those gusty winds and the dry air that we have in place, know that there will be a high fire danger, especially out west towards Del Rio. We're going to talk more about that. I'll show you the map here in just a few minutes, and uh, we'll get into that seven-day forecast as well coming up in just a bit, guys. Thank you, Justin. Just about 934, and this is the accident on the map right now. Uh, let's see, northbound 35, I'm sorry, northbound 37 at Pecan Valley. Uh, major incident has got a couple of lanes closed out there right now. It looks like the ramp is still closed down there at 37 and Pecan Valley, northbound side. We've been talking, as you've just heard, Justin, a lot about the eclipse. You may think it has nothing to do with our local blood supply, but it turns out it does. And it's a big concern for the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center. And with thousands of more people coming to the Hill Country, extra blood will need to be on hand there for extra accidents or emergencies. Our Courtney Friedman tells us it will take your help to boost a supply that is already running low. Jacob Ralsick donates blood and platelets for a special reason. My uh, maternal grandmother passed away from cancer at age 43, and so that's the big driver. What he didn't know is his blood may help people visiting South Texas from states and even countries away. The total solar eclipse is bringing thousands and thousands to smaller communities like those in the hill country. That increases the number of potential accidents or traumatic injuries, and medical centers want to be ready. There are some uh, strategic locations where blood will be pre-positioned. South Texas Blood and Tissue Center supports 48 counties and over 100 medical centers. Specialized program coordinator William Bullock says there's only so much they can pre-plan, so they have multiple transportation modes available. The Gridlock is, is going to be almost inevitable. If there's a large event, we have difficulty getting there with the ground units. Uh, we can get the blood there via the helicopter. Bullock is also keeping in mind all the local cancer or sickle cell patients who depend on blood for their routine procedures. So it, it's a balancing act for sure. The main problem isn't coordination, it's supply. And here at the center, the inventory is already low. Take a look at this. This is O negative, which is the universal blood type. There's only two rows filled. All of this is empty. What they're depending on are donors like Gabrelsic. This is the first time I've done a back-to-back, -back, so this was seven days ago. So it's platelets, so you can do that every every seven days. He and Bullock are confident the community will step up in the next week. Everyone really does kind of galvanize together to, to help their neighbors out. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Switching gears, finding an affordable home to buy has become more and more difficult in recent years. So there's not enough supply to meet demand and mortgage rates are high. Yeah, that's right. And now a new analysis finds that home buyers in nearly half the country need six figure household incomes to comfortably afford a medium priced house. CNN's Jen Sullivan breaks down the numbers for us. Some dismal news for home buyers in the U.S. A recent analysis by Bankrate.com found that in 22 states and Washington, D.C., purchasers need to make a six-figure salary to afford a typical home. 
bank rate calculated that buyers would need to earn $110,871 a year to afford the median home price, which was just over $400,000 in January, according to Redfin. Bankrate found that people in the West and the Northeast will need the most income, while buyers in the South and the Midwest will need the least income. Of course, defining affordability is challenging. Other factors matter too, like savings and debt. And experts say wages haven't kept pace with the rising cost of home ownership. We had a substantial price increase in the past three years, about 30, 40 percent price gain in many parts of the country way outpacing people's income growth, and that is not a healthy development. When it comes to home buying, Lawrence Yoon recommends figuring out a budget and sticking to it. And when it comes to housing costs, he recommends this. About one third of people's gross income should be dedicated for housing costs. For today's Consumer Watch, I'm Jen Sullivan. All right, take a look with us. Places that need the highest household income to afford a pretty typical home are some predictable places, California, Hawaii, which is always very expensive, District of Columbia, Massachusetts, and Washington State. Now, places require the lowest levels of household income to buy in a home are the states of Mississippi at only $63,000 a year, Ohio, Arkansas, Indiana, and Kentucky. Now, as for Texas, you might be wondering, so we are at the very end of the six-figure household income list. According to bankrate.com, the annual income needed to comfortably afford a median priced house is about $100,629. Didn't we have something similar to this uh, when we were comparing, what was it, cities? Was that the affordable the cities? Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. And then I was surprised because well, Laredo was two and a half hours and it was kind of it was it was above Houston. It was. Yeah. So it that was. was interesting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We were just talking about that in the last week or so. Yeah. 938, 63 degrees. You're watching GMSA at nine. Well, last night was the annual film festival for local high schoolers. When we come back, a look at some of the big winners from Bear Fest and what the night meant for these students. A hearty congratulations to all the winners of Bear Fest. The annual film festival pairs local high school students with nonprofits to put their efforts in the spotlight. So East Central High School won big. They won three categories. They had Best Cinematography, Best Picture, and Best Portfolio. Gabriela Pacheco from East Central High School also won the Astound Scholarship. So congratulations. You can see the full list of all the winners on our website at ksat.com. John Paul Barajas was there last night for the festival and awards and tells us how these students got real world experience while also giving back. It's a one of a kind event for multimedia high school students. Definitely exciting, a lot of nerves. The eighth annual Bear Fest showcased the audio and visual work of students from 19 high schools. Tonight we celebrate the work of all of our students and recognize the outstanding achievements from the best of the best. Welcome to Bear Fest. After six months of work, they celebrated in style with a red carpet hosted by KSET's meteorologist Sarah Spivey. It makes us feel like a little bit like celebrities. You know? <laughs> me about the shades indoors, that's a bold statement. My future is just that bright. You know? These students put their skills to use by filming videos for 19 local nonprofits as organized by TRL Productions. Its board president, Buddy Cavo, says it's a win win experience for everyone involved. Students get the experience they need to be working with real professional clients. The nonprofits get these marketing assets that they use to fulfill their mission. And in general, we're introducing kids to a career path. Many students that we spoke to say the opportunity to work in a professional setting was eye-opening. I want to go into film, but now that I've done this compositional piece, I kind of feel like maybe I want to do movie scoring and things like that. So it's definitely broadened my horizons both to what's possible and what I'm capable of doing. And simply a good time. Going to film on site somewhere, because that's not something we get to do like in class a lot. So going like out during the school day has, was really, really fun. Our teacher bought us canes. Shout out to her. Schools took home honors for categories in best storytelling, picture, and cinematography, just to name a few. But when best sound goes to Stevens High School. Students have new material for their portfolios, and nonprofits have fresh videos to help promote their work in the community. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Congratulations, everybody. All right, so listen to this. We just we just put this together mm -hmm. in our in our little heads. Uh, <laughs> what all's happening 
this weekend's oh, beer my goodness. in our region. Yeah. We were already blown away by the fact that you know we're going to have mm -hmm. tens of thousands of people visiting for the Eclipse for Monday, the Eclipse. but back up. Yeah, now we have a sporting event. We have the, the golf tournament. We have the Valero <laughs> Texas Open, which is going to be obviously Thursday through Sunday. And then uh, we have the, the big air show. Out of JBSA yes. Randolph. Which also draws big crowds. In, including the U.S. Air Force Thunderbirds. That's Saturday, Sunday, mm -hmm. and draws huge crowds every year. So, yeah, uh, traffic's going to be a little fun this weekend. <laughs> uh, and I, obviously, we want everyone to enjoy all the events. And, and weather's going to be kind of dicey, too, because oh, we are expecting oh, some yeah. thunderstorms Sunday morning. So that could affect golf and other things going on. So busy. Uh, bottom line, uh, I want to show you the map across the country too. It was busy yesterday in the, in the sense that we had a lot of severe weather stretching from San Antonio. We had hail here all the way up to Cleveland and parts of Michigan. There was a wide swath of severe weather. But the main area that really got hit hard was uh, northern parts of Oklahoma. They had three tornadoes there yesterday. Uh, total of 62 hail reports, but 127 severe storm reports overall. Here's the current setup. Now, there's still some severe weather going on across parts of southern Indiana, uh, Kentucky, into parts of Ohio. And this will be an area that will be hit hard again today. Look at the se severe weather outlook from the Storm Prediction Center, where you see this darker orange color. That's where severe weather is likely, and there probably will be another outbreak of severe weather in this area a little bit later this afternoon. But severe storms will be possible all the way down to the deep south. We're in the clear. We are on the backside of this system now, 62. Dew point is at 46 and dropping with a northwesterly wind at about 9. Now, the wind will be a bit of a concern as it uh, turns gusty this afternoon. Uh, we're expecting gusts upwards of 25 miles per hour, I think, through the morning time into the early afternoon before winds come down just a little bit this evening and tonight. That's going to lead to a high fire danger. So from the uh, Texas A&M Forest Service, as you get out towards Del Rio, this area you see in the uh, dark pink, the red color, that's where the fire risk is highest today in the sense that if a fire were to get started, it would spread very quickly. So we got to be careful. Really, any of our western counties, and, and honestly, San Antonio too, uh, you want to be careful. No outdoor burning or anything like that. Uh, here's the dew point trend over the next six days. We're going to see some pretty dry air today, tomorrow, and Thursday. By Friday, dew points start to come up a little bit, and then Saturday they peak briefly. That'll lead to a chance of showers and storms. Comes back down again Sunday, and hopefully, uh, we'll talk about this in just a second, but hopefully the dry air sticks around on Monday too. That helps us with the eclipse. Uh, and the, the uh, cloud cover. So this first storm system that brought the severe weather quickly moves off to the north and east today. We get into a period of pretty quiet weather throughout the rest of the work week. Then by Saturday, here comes the next storm system. Now it's pretty far north for us. A lot of the energy will be, but it still helps to push front through and that gives us a chance for showers and storms. Then as we get into Monday, the question will be, where does that front set up? When does moisture come back in? And how does that interact with a low out to the west? Needless to say, there are a lot of moving parts here. Uh, so we're not going to say uh, for sure what the weather's going to be like on Monday because I think things could change and they will. Uh, but uh, right now, we think there's probably going to be more clouds and clear sky. But the rain chance is backing off a little bit, so that's good. That's the latest with the eclipse. But as I said, as we get into the next couple of days, we'll have a much better idea uh, once we get some consistency with our computer models. 80 degrees tomorrow, 83 on Thursday. I want to let everyone know, too, that you may need a jacket Wednesday and Thursday morning. It'll be in the 40s, even wow. Friday morning. Uh, and by Saturday, we turn cloudy. There's that chance of rain Saturday night into Sunday morning. That obviously could affect golfers at the Bolero Texas Open. And 20% yeah. uh, chance of rain. That's what we have it right now for Monday. Could also hmm. affect the air show you as bet. well. Sure. Yeah. I mean, depending on the cloud deck, the Thunderbirds have what they call a low show. Okay. But, I mean, if there's storms in the area, they probably yeah. won't do much of anything. It's all going to depend on timing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll continue to update the forecast as okay. right, we'll often as possible. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. Yeah. Well, it's game day for the San Antonio Spurs, and they are playing the Nuggets tonight in Denver, though. So tip-off is set for 8 p.m. The Spurs are down a few players. Uh, that's a reminder, though. Yesterday, the team announced that Jeremy Sohan and Dev Vassell were out indefinitely with serious injuries. Vassell has a stress fracture in his right foot, and Sohan was diagnosed with a left ankle impingement. So also out there... Uh, or Keldon Johnson with a foot injury and Dominic Barlow with a knee injury. So after today, there are only six more games left in the regular season for the Spurs. 
The final four is set for both the men's and women's uh, NCAA tournament. Number one, South Carolina will face number three, NC State, in the women's tournament Friday. And then number one, Iowa will take on number three, UConn, after Iowa took care of business last night against LSU in an outstanding high-paced game. Then in the men's tournament, number one, UConn will play number four, Alabama, on Saturday. And number 11, NC State will try to upset number one, Purdue, to make it to the championship game. Yeah, going back to the Spurs, we went there. We did get to see Wimby, of course, uh, but we saw Jeremy sit out. Uh, uh, Sohan and also Devin Vassell, like on, on the side, they didn't get to play. It's rare that you descend a game and the Spurs lose. They usually win when you oh, show up. Oh, I know. <laughs> but I mean, that being said, my, my mother is a huge Steph Curry fan, and I mean, a lot of people in San Antonio are though, because when we headed out, you know, a lot of them were kind of crowded when you know when he hit the floor. Sure. Uh, so she was she was happy she got to see him as well. I'm glad she did too. Thank All right, you. taking on Denver tonight, the champs. We'll yes. see what happens. Good luck, guys. Yeah, go, go Spurs, go. Go Spurs, go. <laughs> Time now is 951 and 64 degrees for now. Let's go out to the zoo where it's always a great day to go to the San Antonio Zoo. See, see thing, what things are happening right now at the crane exhibit. Where things are very low key at 951 on a Tuesday morning. Felicity Huffman is back on TV and there's a new number one on the Billboard Hot 100 singles chart. And how is the remake of Roadhouse doing on Amazon? Well, ABC's Jason Nathanson tells us in today's Hollywood Minute. Former Desperate Housewives star Felicity Huffman will return to television for the first time since serving time behind bars for the Varsity Blues college admission scandal. She'll guest star in the Paramount Plus spinoff Criminal Minds Evolution, playing a psychiatrist who helps the FBI. Huffman was one of 33 parents, including Full House actress Lori Loughlin, who faced federal charges in the admissions scandal. She spent 11 days in prison in 2019. Pop another bottle if you like it. Future, Metro Boomin, and Kendrick Lamar popping bottles. Their song, Like That, debuts at number one on the Billboard Hot 100 singles chart. It's one of five songs from the album We Don't Trust You to debut in the top ten. And the album itself is number one on the Billboard 200. I got a tip for you. Don't let no one get this close. Jake Gyllenhaal's Roadhouse remake is a winner for Amazon, its Prime Video's most watched film debut ever, with an audience of 50 million, they say. You also have to know how to navigate the galaxy. And what did baby Yoda get him for his birthday? The Mandalorian star Pedro Pascal is 49 today. And that's what's happening in Hollywood. I'm Jason Adams and ABC News, Los Angeles. Yeah. If you need Eclipse glasses for next week, don't forget about our latest giveaway happening later today. Adam Casco will be out at Tacos Norteño on Hebner near Eckert. So you can start lining up at 5 p.m. and glasses are going to be handed out at 6.30. There are only 300, so make sure you get in line early. And if you can't make it today, don't worry. We're going to hold another giveaway tomorrow. Pretty much every day for the rest of the week because the clock is ticking. Yes, we're getting close. I'm getting very excited. And then, oh, don't forget, you're going to be asking questions tomorrow evening. Yes, live stream, <laughs> 7 o'clock. Thanks for joining us.